the American Academy of Dermatology, acne is the most common skin disorder in the US, affecting around 50 million Americans. In the past decade, adult acne has been rising and has come to be known as a common skin disorder and not just a teen skin problem. Today, more than 17 million adults are diagnosed with acne, 50% being adult women and 25% being adult men. Regardless of age, race, and gender, 85% of the population experience some form of acne. So as professional skin therapists, there is much we can do to help, educate, and treat people with this disorder. So what is acne? The definition of acne is a genetic disease causing the malfunction of the pilosebaceous unit, characterized by many lesions from comedones to pustules to cysts. In dermatology and skin care, acne is graded into four areas to be able to determine the severity of the condition. In general, acne can be divided into two major types, grade one to two, which is usually mild to moderate acne, found mainly on the face and is non-scarring, and grade three to four, which is often moderate to severe and may be found on the chest, back, and it may scar. Let's explore what lesions you may find within the grades. Grade one, or mild acne, consists of microcomedones, closed and open comedones, and will have little or no inflammation. Grade two, or moderate acne, has inflammatory papules or pimples along with comedones. Grade three is classified as severe and is commonly known as acne vulgaris and has papules, pustules, and comedones. Grade four acne is very severe and is referred to as cystic or nodular acne and has all of the aforementioned lesions along with acne cysts and nodules and causes the most amount of scarring. Grades three and four may need to be addressed medically by a dermatologist to truly see improvements. But this does not mean that a client should not also receive skin coaching and home care recommendations from a skin therapist. In fact, a combined approach will bring about the most successful outcome for a client or patient. Let's explore the four main factors that contribute to acne. Number one, the type of follicle involved with acne. Two, cell proliferation and desquamation. Three, the sebaceous gland and sebum. And four, the bacteria that's involved with acne. Beginning with the follicle, there are three types of hair follicles that occur in the skin. Sebaceous follicles, which comprise of a tiny hair or may have no hair involved, are what are involved with acne. They have exceptionally large multi-lobed sebaceous glands and are only found on the face, upper arms, chest, and upper back, which is why we see acne occurring in these areas. Sebum prevents hair from drying out. It keeps the skin supple, but also inhibits the growth of certain bacteria. But the issue with sebaceous follicles is that waste builds up and with only a tiny hair or no hair, this waste cannot exit the follicle, resulting in a blockage or a plug. An overproliferation of skin cells causes many problems, from psoriasis to acne development. We naturally produce a million dead skin cells about every 40 minutes, or 36 million skin cells per day, and they naturally desquamate. But in acne, we produce four to five times that amount. Also, the natural sloughing process is disturbed. We call this condition retention hyperkeratosis. Why does this happen? Acne skins lack tiny particles called lamellogranules. They're important in stimulating the natural release of dead cells. So to recap, we have large sebaceous glands, no hair to wick out the sebum, more cells, and no natural desquamation process. So what else could go wrong? The third factor concerns the sebaceous gland. In studies on acneic skin, the average sebum secretion rate is three times greater than normal skin. It is also different in composition. There are higher levels of squalene and wax esters and lower levels of linoleic acid. And this makes sebum thicker and stickier. What causes three times the amount of sebum to be produced? Hormones. The sebaceous gland is largely under the influence of androgens, the so-called male hormones that are present in both men and women and they're secreted by the adrenal glands, the ovaries and the testes. Testosterone specifically is one of the androgens and this hormone is converted to dehydrotestosterone by an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. 
and this directly stimulates the cells to produce more sebum. Why is this important? Well, to help control acne shutting off, this enzyme is one action that will help to slow down sebum production. And today, we have access to ingredients that actually have this capability. Sebum is rich in waxes, and that provides a favorable environment for bacteria to flourish, which brings us to our fourth factor. Bacteria known as propionic bacterium acne, or P. acnes, also play a part in the development of acne, particularly with inflamed lesions. This bacteria live anaerobically, meaning they don't need oxygen, and they feed on sebum. So when the follicle becomes blocked, and there's no air and plenty of food, this bacteria thrives. It begins to break down sebum composition to produce fatty acids, which irritate the lining of the follicle. And this leads to inflammation in the skin. So let's recap again. We have multi-lobe sebaceous follicles with a rudimentary hair or no hair to wick out the sebum. We have cells being produced at four to five times the normal rate, which are sloughing off into the follicle. We have thicker, stickier type of sebum that's being produced in abundance and a type of bacteria that thrives and feeds on the sebum, causing inflammation and pain. Let's now go through some of the common triggers for acne and those things that acne-prone clients should really be sensitive about. And we need to know this to be able to better educate them about what they should avoid. Cosmetics. Certain ingredients used in poor quality makeup, hair, and some skin products affect the function of the skin and can irritate the follicle lining, like petroleum-derived ingredients, like mineral oil, isopropyl isosterate, and myristate, acetylated lanolin, artificial colors like DNC red number 30, and PVPs. The environment, UV rays, seasonal changes, hot, humid climates, and pollution can stimulate cell production, sebum, and blood flow, and this exacerbates acne. Medications. Acne can be the side effect of steroids and some drugs to treat epilepsy and depression. Hormones. As discussed, the sebaceous gland is very sensitive to hormone levels, especially testosterone and androgens. This is very noticeable, of course, during puberty, through the menstrual cycle, through pregnancy, and through times of prolonged stress. New studies also indicate a possible link between hyperthyroidism in postmenopausal women and acne. Friction from synthetic fabrics, occlusive sweat-proof clothing, and areas of friction from phones to sport clothing can cause breakouts. Picking. Poor hygiene and bad extraction techniques will cause acne to worsen. And some clients are obsessed with the picking of their acne. So it's something you really need to coach them on. Some industrial oils and chemicals when in contact with skin will also cause acne. So what can we do to treat acne now that we understand the physiology and the causes? Let's review some of the ingredient technology that's available to us as skin therapists to treat acne. By inhibiting the activity of the overactive sebaceous glands, we not only eliminate the food source for the bacteria, but we also eliminate oily shine. Look for sebum regulating agents like naughty hydrogyuretic acid, yeah, it's a long word, niacinamide, yeast, horse chestnut, sarcosine, and zinc gluconate. To control cell accumulation and reduce impactions in the follicle, we need to stimulate natural exfoliation, superficially as well as in the follicle lining. Salicylic acid and lactic acid are key ingredients to look for. Tea tree oil, benzoyl peroxide, spiria, salicylic acid, zinc gluconate, and zinc sulfate will help to control bacteria on the skin surface as well as in the follicle. To reduce redness and inflammation, green tea, menthol, camphor, and comb flour will soothe and repair the skin and also reduce scarring. Now let's review what treatments and protocols you should follow in the treatment room to treat acne successfully. When performing treatments on clients with acne, the most important aspect of the treatment will be the consultation and analysis of the skin. During the consultation, it is vital to find out if the client is already using products, taking medications, or receiving treatments to target acne or oil secretion. If any discoveries are made, the treatment plan will need to be modified accordingly. 
Keep in mind that if someone is working with a physician in the treatment of acne, it is important to design your treatment around the effects or changes happening in the skin. This will prove to be by far more effective in the final outcome. During the skin analysis portion of your treatment, look for the following key conditions and lesions on the skin. Open and closed comedones are the most common non-inflammatory lesion a skin therapist will work on. An open comedone is commonly called a blackhead due to the surface of the plug in the follicle having a blackish appearance. Closed comedones are commonly called a whitehead or milia. Closed comedones are typically skin colored and may cause a slight bump in the skin. Papules and pustules. Papules develop when there is a high break in the follicle wall that empties into the dermis. White blood cells attach and a sore red lesion is then felt. Papules have the potential to develop into a pustule. This change occurs when a white blood cell attacks, pus is produced, and the yellow cap of pus is visible on the surface of the skin. We should not extract these papules and pustules, however we can still offer treatments to reduce inflammation, exfoliate, and treat. Nodules and cysts. Nodules are like a papule, but more of a solid dome-shaped or irregular-shaped lesion. Cysts are sac-like lesions containing liquid or semi-liquid material consisting of white blood cells, dead cells, and bacteria. Both are characterized by inflammation and can extend into the deeper layers of the skin. Either characteristic can be painful and lead to the destruction of tissue resulting in scarring. We would not extract nodules or cysts, but can still give treatment. The focus would be more on bringing down the inflammation. Once you have fully analyzed and determined the extent of the acne lesion, you are now able to put together a treatment protocol. Let's go over some of the options you would incorporate into your treatment for someone that has typical open and closed comedones. Let's start with the beginning step of our treatment protocol, cleansing. It is important that a double cleanse is taking place. The first cleanse is best done with an oil-based cleanser to attract surface oils, makeup, and sunscreen. The second cleanse is then able to remove any congestion and residual debris from the skin. Using an antibacterial for the second cleanse is best to not only remove any surface congestion, but also destroy any bacteria from spreading or developing. Exfoliation will be the next step. Of course, if a client is on medically prescribed exfoliants, this step will be a contraindication. The focus would then be on soothing and hydrating the skin. If they're not on any medically prescribed exfoliants, then you have a range of exfoliants to choose from. Grains or granular exfoliants are excellent for someone that is not experiencing any form of inflammation. This type of exfoliant is great for clients looking to reduce oil production, remove congestion, thick or coarse skin, or as a deep cleanse. Enzymes are great to use when someone is experiencing inflammation or as a light exfoliant. Enzymes remove only what is necessary and create a better environment for extractions. By being slightly more alkaline, enzymes will help in softening the skin, allowing the extractions to slide out. This is ideal for a client's skin that has fine pores or you find it difficult to extract. Hydroxy acids are used to dissolve sebum, excess skin cells, or oils. Salicylic acid is the ideal hydroxy acid to choose as it is not only an antibacterial and an anti-inflammatory, but it also decongests the follicle by dissolving sebum. All of these exfoliants can be combined together to achieve desired results based on your observations during the skin analysis step. Once we've exfoliated the keratinized cells, the next step is to move into extractions. Many times, no matter how much you try to extract an impaction, nothing will come out, or the skin just feels tight. The solution to this problem is softening the skin. Disincrustation is a term used to describe a pre-softening treatment prior to manual extractions. Disincrustation may consist of a soapless skin softening solution applied under steam and left on while extractions are completed. Alternatively, this solution can be used with galvanic current. Whichever method is used, disincrustation is a tool that will mix with the oily comedone plugs soften them, and make extractions much easier. Let's talk more about extractions. Extractions are a part that so many professional skin therapists love. Your technique is paramount in providing safe, effective, and hygienic extractions. The IDI signature extraction technique is not only safe, but also effective, 
and working from the base up and gently pressing blockages out of the follicle, even in hard to reach areas. By working this way, not only are you hygienic and preventing infections, but you are also reducing the chances of scarring. Affected acne lesions are better left alone and not advised to be extracted in the skincare setting. Treating with a topical drying solution like benzoyl peroxide, hydroxy gels, or enzymes and clays is more recommended. High frequency is a great technology to use in the treatment room after extractions or if extractions are not able to be performed. High frequency has a drying and germicidal effect on the surface of the skin by sending ozone to the impaction. The ozone is quickly broken down into active oxygen and destroys any bacteria. High frequency should be used over a dry gauze on the skin to minimize the chance of making too wide of a gap between the skin and the electrode, which could result in a burn. Microcurrent or galvanic is handy to push anti-acne ingredients into the skin. Incorporate this technology after extractions, during the mass stage, or before a moisturizer is applied. Galvanic is also great for those skin conditions that are hard to extract, but you also want to help relieve that congestion. An effleurage or Swedish style massage on the face is a contraindication for someone that is suffering from acne. While we all love to receive the step in the treatment, doing a pressure point style massage is ideal and just as relaxing as effleurage. Incorporate an oil-free medium to enhance the results without feeling heavy or oily on the skin. Masks can be that step in the treatment to bring everything together, in addition to further hydrating or calming the skin. Choose a sulfur or clay-based mask to dry up or remove any oil on the skin. Incorporate a hydrating gel or a calming oat-based mask for someone that may be experiencing dehydration or inflammation with the breakouts. A final tip is the use of a Dr. Lucas pulverizer or a vac spray can be useful in acne treatments for several reasons. First, it helps to remove cleansing products, clay masks, or exfoliant residue from the skin without rubbing the skin with sponges or cloths. Next, it can be used to also rehydrate the skin and soothe with a fine mist of pulverized herb extracts at the conclusion of the treatment. Now that we have covered what can be used in the treatment room, let's review some of the most common medical options for acne. Clients could be prescribed an oral such as isotretinoin, antibiotics, or birth control. Topical vitamin A derived medications like Retin-A, Differin, or Adopalene may be used. The use of an LED blue light may be used to target treating the Propion bacterium acnes or P acnes. IPL is used not only to treat the P acnes, but it can also be used to reduce post inflammatory pigmentation that may result. Both LED or IPL may be used with the Levilon, a specific photosensitizer, to destroy bacteria and shrink the sebaceous glands, minimizing the production of oil. Treatment of the after effects of acne. Dermabrasion was once the main treatment for any skin or texture concerns. Now, doctors are combining medium to deep chemical peels with laser treatments such as Fraxel or Erbium. Of course, treatments, product recommendations, and advice should be combined together to create a comprehensive program that our clients are then able to follow. Together with this program and providing support to our clients will not only affect the physiological aspect of acne, but also help with the emotional effect that acne can have on a client's self-esteem. Each prescription should start off with a daily recommendation progressing into a weekly and monthly routine. You can include tips to your clients like, use a cotton pillowcase and change them daily. Minimize the use of fabric softeners as these can coat the skin. Screen makeup that may cause congestion or be comogenic. Avoid high fat, high sugar, processed foods, and possibly dairy as this could contribute to breakouts. Be mindful of pet dander in areas that you lay down or place your face on. Of course, you can find these tips and more information on acne by logging on to thedermalinstitute.com. We hope you have enjoyed our webisode. To receive a copy of the notes, fill out a short survey on the link provided. Have a great day.